to those that might not know, a CEO's role, what is your, or well, what is your main responsibility? You know, everything. You know, yeah. The buck yeah. stops with you. you. You're the boss of everything. So you're responsible for all the employees. You're responsible for all the, act the operational activities. You report to the board. You, you employed by the board and you report to the board, but you employ everybody else underneath it. So, so every, every single facet of uh, Gold Circle's activities I'm responsible for. Welcome to another edition of In The Box Seat. And talking about In The Box Seat, well, we're in the hot seat because we're in the CEO's office here at Hollywood Bets Gravel, Gold Circle, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce, well, I'll, I'll introduce our CEO first because we don't want to lose oh, our jobs. So, so the, you know, you'll have to just sit tight for a moment. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podcast today our CEO and uh, trusted good friend and colleague, Michelle Narek. How are you, Michelle? Yeah, I'm good. Just a bit nervous to be sitting around my office, you know, in front of you guys. But uh, we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to go through that and see how we can improve. <laughs> well, we, we sometimes, we normally, uh, you, you, when you call for us to come to the CEO's office, we get a little bit jittery. Yes. And now it's the opposite way around. Yeah, correct. And I don't even have the time to ask, but I have not to move all the confidential information that's sitting in front of me. So now <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling very vulnerable. <laughs> not at all, not at all. We had to enjoy a few minutes with you. And just basically to find out your story about, you know, racing and, and your love for the sport and, and, and all the years that you've dedicated to this lovely industry. Um, so the first question that I ask all our guests is, how did you hear about this beautiful sport of horse racing? How did you get involved in the game? And when did it all happen for you? Well, it, it, it all started in Mauritius. It's an easy question. My dad used to go racing every Saturday in Mauritius. And I used to go with him in uh, uh, Morris Fausen, that he had a black one. We used to go every Saturday, watch the races. Uh, six races at the time, and I think probably about 15 race meetings a year. So this was the highlight of, of uh, uh, our social activities. Then when I got to be uh, in my uh, early teens, I think. I it stopped. was just the other day, in your early teens. Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Rahel's age, you see. <laughs> he's still a teenager. Uh, I started horse riding um, at the Cluby Peak de Moise, the, the riding club. Uh, that led to me riding in, in amateur races in Mauritius. At the end of the racing season every year, there were three meetings reserved for amateurs. Yeah, it was 70 kilos ago, I, I understand. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, but, uh, so in my last two years of school, I, I, I rode, uh, uh, well, got my horses ready for, for, for racing. Uh, the race, the one, the one year, and then the next year I broke a collarbone playing rugby and my horse was super fit and that's the year where he won two out of his three starts Jeez. and uh, I would have, uh, would have been able to win. The, the year before I had another horse and I, I did a second. I tossed the race. It was a <laughs> shocking ride. <laughs> so my love for horses has been there. You know, I taught, I took my riding degrees from uh, Saumur. Uh, they sent inspectors to Mauritius to, to grade our I got my grade one and grade two, and then started teaching uh, an English lessons for the kids from the, the naval base in, in Bakwa, HMS uh, base. Uh, so the horses have been part of my life uh, from a very early age. Michelle, <laughs> Mauritius racing, the vibe on course. You know, I had the privilege of going to Mauritius, and, and why I look at you and I direct this statement to you is because you haven't been to Mauritius yet, have you? No, not at all. In the lead up to me going for the very first time, and it was actually for my mom's 70th birthday, and she's now 80, so it was 10 years ago. And, and we obviously are Mauritian families, and, and born my dad in Mauritius, etc. I'd never been, so I went late in my life. And somebody said to me, you're going on holiday, you have to go racing. I said, well, it's, 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 it's uh, without a doubt. But, and everyone says the crowds, and you look at the TV, and you, you see the race cards being thrown up, and the gentlemen and the gentle ladies all there, and you, you can't comprehend it. And I thought, it can't be that good. I mean, there's just a few people there shouting, and it's impossible. We get to the races. I have never experienced anything 
in my life like I did at Mauritius. The banging on the on the on the roofs and there's people on the roof. There's people everywhere. They close the road. Is that just for an ordinary race meeting? Ordinary, run of the mill, everyday racing, and that vibe. I remember I got goosebumps. It, it's it's. I mean, how those horses don't even flinch. They they're just used to it, I suppose. Yeah. That's a vibe I've never experienced anywhere else, Michelle. Yeah, but before we go into Mauritius, you obviously got courage just to broadcast your mum's. Uh, age. <laughs> she doesn't listen. She hasn't yeah, got social yeah, media. Yeah. You're in for a big trouble. <laughs> and you're gonna if you start that way, you'll slip up soon and tell your wife's age pretty soon. So. <laughs> oh, well, that's easy. She's yeah. 23. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're just always been very special. Obviously, the the racing is it's a very tight course. It's a very old course. It's the oldest racing club in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and the second or third oldest uh, race club in the world. So it was started by the British. Uh, it's 1812 was the first race meeting. They had sure. two race courses at the time. Uh, and by far the most popular activity on the island. Uh, it was a national sport, wasn't it? Uh, it still is. It still is, okay. In terms of following. Uh, Obviously what's changed is that with the ad advent of television and activities and, and, and social media and all this, people have got other things to do. Uh, but at one stage you had on their big race day, the Maiden Cup, which is a tw 2400 uh, called a Maiden Cup, it's not for maidens. Um, <laughs> they had uh, in some years 10% of the whole population of the island on course. Sure. In over 110,000 you had a population of, of less than a million then on course for the for the for that race so uh, uh, it's part of the it's part of the folklore the the culture of the island everywhere you go people talk racing every taxi you catch at, at customs uh, the one year i took some friends across to mauritius and because mauritius is very flexible uh, when it used to be on, on on the race cars i asked the the club to put the horse of mine in the name of a friend that was traveling mm. with Okay. And uh, which is doable. So the horse is registered to you as the owner, but if you're not, you're traveling, or you can't come racing, and you want it to run in Warren's name, you can do that. It'll still run in your colors and in Warren's name. Um, but that's changed this year. The and uh, so she got to customs uh, traveling. It was, uh, in fact, uh, the, got to the customs, and the customs officer was stamping a passport and said, "You got a runner tomorrow." And she says, no, I don't think so. Do we have, she turned to us and do we have runners in Durban tomorrow? And he said, no, no, we don't. We had one on Wednesday. No, no, you got a running tomorrow here in Mauritius. Yes. What's the chances? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know, you see. The, so it's, uh, everybody talks racing. Yeah. Everybody. Was it, is it like a lifestyle there for them? It's a lifestyle. It's, 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 it's part, I think it's part of what we call the patrimoine. It's 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 part of the the fabric of Mauritius. Yes. You know what I, I find? Sorry to interrupt you. You know what I find so interesting too. That was the first uh, experience I had, and then we went on our first trip uh, over there uh, to Montchoisie Beach, mm. and and the general public would you know were there as well, and normally uh, reading books or, or yes. newspaper. Everybody had the Race Time magazine, and and literally most people lying on the beach and enjoying that like we're all reading their form guards for the mm -hmm. weekend it was f fantastic to see it really was yeah um racing publication is very big just as big as it is in australia for example you, yeah. you, everywhere you go you've got racing publications e everything racing is front page news the colors just going back you say it has changed but you're quite right so if there was a horse called long ruler and, and there were 10 owners, this time it ran, it would run in Mr. Narak's colours, then Mr. Radhakrishna's colours, and then next week Mr. Len Furness's colours, and so it would rotate, which I think is nice. Uh, phew, but to, uh, the, the, the admin of that, wouldn't, wasn't the, wouldn't that have been a nightmare to try and Well, if we were to do it here with 364 race meetings a year, it might cause a bit of admin problems. But in Mauritius, they race 30 times a year, okay. 35 times a year. It's not, and it's a week between race meetings, so it, 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 and you know they're geared for it. So the horse is registered in your name, it belongs to you, uh, but you know, you, when your trainer nominates the horse to run, he says, Warren's horse is running, but it'll rain, rain and run in the name of this person because Warren is overseas, he's okay. asked for his mother. Okay. <laughs> for her 80 year old mother yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for to run in i mean it, it's it's not an issue sure it's, okay, that's it's actually very user friendly it creates interest as well you yeah know. that is it's a great idea talking about racehorse ownership and and 
he has a question that we haven't scripted, but it's a, it's, it's a question, that, an advice that I'm asking you to give this young man, because resource ownership, they are part of a young syndicate called the People Syndicate. And there's so many syndicates. We saw yesterday Dean Canamea Racing Syndicate, uh, but I don't want to list them all because there's so many syndicates. But when they came to ask me about, you know, owning a share in a horse, because everyone thinks you can't own a share in a horse, it's only for the rich, it's only for, you know, the people that have got millions. And I said, these syndicates are the way to go. But what other bit of advice could you give these youngsters out there that are wanting to take a share in a racehorse? I mean, what advice do you give a racehorse owner? The, the, uh, uh, racehorse owner advice and the way to participate in the game, this, this is two separate questions. Uh, in order to allow uh, younger people, uh, racing is an expensive hobby. Uh, to participate, syndication is a great way to do it. You, you can divide the load of feeding a racehorse uh, by as many as, as it's allowed in terms of the rules. It was 40 the last time I looked at. I'm not sure how much it is now. And it doesn't mean you won't get success. I mean, you know, the the derby was won, uh, you know, the Epsom derby was, was won by a syndicate of, of owners. And, and the one in the race in Australia, which yeah. is... Um, yeah. Melbourne Cup. Yeah, also yeah, massive. Melbourne Cup. So uh, success can follow whenever you're lucky to, enough to buy the good horse that's going to win. So it's, it's an easy way to participate. It's, it's, uh, it's a much af more affordable way to, to participate. But racing ownership, I think you, you need to be bitten by the bug. Yes. Uh, once you've experienced the feeling of your horse passing the post and you've shouted him home, you then forget all the pain and suffering <laughs> that you've had in terms of payments that you make every yes. month and the huge amount of money that you could have used some, for somewhere else that you regret all the time. Uh, that, that feeling that of ecstasy, you know, once you get that bug, nothing will compare this. You compare it to other people with other passions in their lives where they have this incredible uh, feeling because something special happens, you know, holding one at golf or, or, or succeeding in, in, in scoring a goal when you play soccer or whatever it is. You know, that feeling is, is unbelievable and it washes away all the pain yeah. for a while. <laughs> it and, certainly and, does. Well, certainly for a while, you know, yeah, the, yeah. but once you've got the bugs. Yeah, that's you know, it. Mm -hmm. I've held a record for the most consecutive lasts in racing. I've had <laughs> 13 consecutive lasts. So you've had 13 runners and all 13 ran lasts in a row? In a row. I remember it was nine. I was in, on holiday in Mauritius uh, playing golf with Alan Michel. Uh, and uh, he says, how's your horses going? I said, I've had, n I've had nine lasts in a row. That night he phoned me, he said, it's not 10, but <laughs> <laughs> I had a horse running in Cape Town uh, with Candice uh, Bass Roberts and Robert Fidev had, had picked for us. Uh, he had run last. <laughs> so it was your 10th one. Uh, but uh, it went up to 13 and then the wheel turned and then you start getting winners. Yeah, and, the but you're still stuck in you're stuck uh, yeah, with it. And, well, uh, you know patience. that's going to happen. You know, the, yeah. the, the pyramid of good horses to bad horses is actually very, very, sh yeah. very sharp descent. Uh, you're lucky enough to win one race. Right, exactly. you know, the, the one third of the horses bred at sales in the old days you used to finish their careers as a one-time winner. Do you think that's probably the reason why people are reluctant to get involved in race horse ownership because the chances of winning are so low. I mean, in a 10 horse field, only one horse is able to win and that's only one lucky owner, one lucky trainer. Hmm. And so people tend to say, I'd rather use my money somewhere else and spend it with a racehorse because as you mentioned, you're going to be paying bills and that's a lot of money that you have to pay for training bills and for the upkeep of the horse. So it's not worth it to them. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an expensive hobby. Yeah. And that's why syndication is such a beautiful thing. Because if you can take the pain away of every month getting those separate bills, as you say, transport, vets, farriers, and all this, you, and you end up paying up front a small amount of money that sees you for a year, yeah. uh, you don't have to be reminded. And, you, and, and when you buy a horse, it's normally the horse will run 18 months later. And for 18 months, you're going to have that pain and suffering. So syndication has helped a lot in that. It yeah. gives you the possibility to do away with the pain and come for the fun that yeah. um there's this yeah that uh, i've seen them in their syndicate uh, i think they've had two or three fourths or a third and the excitement uh, and i can't wait to see the day and you can never predict that day 
when they have their first winner because the other day when they ran fourth, they were cheering and shouting, you were all clapping. It was Are so you great. that bad of a tipster? You can't predict that day. No, I can't predict. No, I'm a shocking <laughs> tipster. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, the one owner, he made me laugh. He said, when I heard you and D's not tipping our horse, I doubled my bet. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> was that the one for Dean Canavar? Mr. Dean Canavar, yes, number two. What was his name? Ideal Act. Ideal Act, that's right. Yeah, and uh, but of course, he was only joking. He's a, he's a dear racing man. But um, Michelle, the various jobs in racing that you've held over the years, I mean, I know we haven't got the time to talk about all of them, but uh, basically you've, you've had a hand in, in most, most departments, most areas. Well, I started my career in, in racing as a bloodstock agent. Okay. Uh, you know, I, when I finished my articles here, uh, I bought a restaurant. That didn't go very well. Uh, and then the Mauritius market, open for, for owners to buy their own horses. It used to be the club that used to buy the horses. So there was an opportunity and uh, started my bloodstock business. First joined Andy Williams. I spent a year or two learning from him then went on my own in 87. Um, so started Michelin Iraq bloodstock in 1987 and it's still operating this day or the, or the you know, but it it's gone down in activity quite a lot, you know, obviously I don't have the time to do any buying and selling, but I still do shipping horses to Mauritius okay. uh, from time to time. Um, and that got me involved, you know, once I went on my own, Ricky Mangard came and saw me and wanted me to be his bloodstock agent and the business grew, I had Willie Peters, Michael Miller, you know, we had good friends in racing and through that process became a, a committee member of the KZN Owners and Trainers Association. Uh, then when the, the clubs amalgamated in 1998, uh, KZN Note had two seats on the board. So when Wayne Aldridge, who was the vice chairman, emigrated to Australia, I became vice chairman and became a director of Gold Circle. Cecil Bates was our chairman. Uh, and. Uh, then got involved, you know, Chris Saunders became the chairman, asked me to become the CEO of Gold Circle in 2002, and that's, that's where I've been since. There was a period of two years where, where I wasn't there, the, the board asked me to leave in 20, no, 2009, and then the new board in 2009 asked me to come back. So uh, that's the only function I've done. Okay. You know, I've held okay. the post of CEO for 20 years. Less two, so 18 years. Oh, no. Too much. <laughs> Your role, I mean, again, we can't, you know, not every item, but I mean, you know, to those that might not know, a CEO's role, what is your, well, what is your main responsibility? You know, everything. You know, yeah. The yeah. buck stops with you. you. You're the boss of everything. So you're responsible for all the employees. You're responsible for all the act operational activities. You report to the board. You, you employed by the board and you report to the board, but you employ everybody else underneath us. So, so every, every single facet of uh, Gold Circle's activities I'm responsible for. Having worked with you for, believe it or not, going on to I think our seventh or eighth year, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big job, it's a tough job, but you're always smiling, you're always, you know, got a joke to tell and, and you know, there's obviously a fun side of you but there's obviously also a very serious side of you but negativity in this industry unfortunately is there and, and negativity in life how do you handle it because most times nine times out of ten and been in meetings with you you know you're upbeat you're positive you're always looking on the good side of things yeah the, the one the one thing about horse racing is that it's it's so multifaceted there's so many different uh, interest by individual people that you have challenges in different spheres. You'll have one day a member unhappy about something that happens to him in his experience on the race day. The next day it's going to be a trainer who's had a problem with his training facility or, you know, th so there's always where you've got a customers that are dissatisfied because the the teller didn't didn't listen to him take his bet properly and things of that nature. So it's very multifaceted and you, you are prone to a lot of uh, uh, conflicts and if you're not able to handle this, then you're in your wrong position. Um, my approach has always been, you know, I've got a very open door policy. People come to me with whatever their problems are. Uh, I deal with them to the best of my ability. The, so if, if you are of the type of personality that's affected by criticism and negativity, then you're in, you're in the wrong industry. Sure, sure. You know, it's, uh, it's a very competitive industry. As, as 
ten, as you said, ten horses running in a, in a race. There's only one yeah. winner, and that uh, that is. So you're going to have nine losers. Yeah, you, you nine unhappy people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got nine, nine unhappy people versus one happy person. So the negativity has got to be more sure. uh, than the average that you would have in other industry. Yeah. Gee, that's a good way of putting it. I never and even thought of it that way. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it's it's scary to to think that you are going to get those who will accept defeat, but then there's those who will wish bad on the one who is <laughs> yes, who's fortunate doing well. enough to to have won the race and. What, what does racing mean to you? What is racing to you and how does it, uh, what type of role does it play in your life since you are so uh, involved in it, be it South African racing, Mauritius racing? You know, the racing has been my life. It's as, as simple as that. My whole, my whole adult life, I've been involved in racing in some shape or form. In fact, before, uh, even as a kid, you know, uh, loved racing. So it's, it's been my whole life. There's not much more to my life than racing, you know, when you think about it. I think if you take racing and food <laughs> uh, away from me, there's nothing left. You know, the <laughs> yeah. Talking about food, you enjoy, I mean, most Mauritians do, most, most people enjoy a good hearty meal and they love their food. What, what's, the staple, what's the main food at Mauritius, uh, well, something that uh, yeah. everyone loves? Yeah, every, the, the base food is rice, everybody eats yeah. rice, so rice is imported, mostly from India. The, the, so rice is the staple diet, and then on top of that you've got all the condiments that go Lentils around, you, know, and what, you know, your dried grains, your, you know, the, but the, the, so we eat a lot of rice. So do you, do you enjoy a good Durban curry, yeah? Yeah, except I think I make a better curry than most restaurants that oh, serve that's it. That's a, that's a yeah. and, and, and I can agree with him because the Mauritians can cook. As we yeah. say, the Indian community, I mean, we, we've said it on many podcasts, the Indian community are, can cook beautifully. You know, all nationalities can cook. But the Mauritians too are not, not, not bad cooks at all. Not you bad you cooks know at all. the uh, uh, Mauritius little island stuck in the middle of the Indian Ocean uh, had to survive because there's nothing else but fish around and what yeah. you could grow agriculturally on the mm. island. So you had to survive on imports. So you had to devise a lot of methods to conserve food. There was no refrigeration or whatever it is over, over those days. And if supplies didn't come in, you didn't eat, yeah. except to what you, you could produce. So the, you know, with the huge Indian influence, it's same as in Durban, Indians were imported to cut the sugar cane. Mm. And being clever, they decided they would rather own it. And they stayed, you know, the, and the, the influence, the Indian influence on the cooking, uh, the French tradition of good cooking, because remember the Mauritius was part of, the, it belonged to the French crown, not to, the, not to France. Oh. And on all those colonies, they, they used to send the bad boys of, but of the highest aristocracy. You know, the, so you had a lot of culinary skills. Oh. So there you've had, you know, you know, then the English came, they brought nothing to, to culinary skills, as you know, the English cooking is very bland. Yes. <laughs> but there you had this French, no French base, influenced by the Indian, uh, Indian cooking and the spices and everything. And so you got a fantastic mix of uh, Mauritius cuisine is very good. I would say that, obviously, because that's yes. what I eat. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about Mauritius, I mean, it's 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 uh, part of our discussion. I mean, it's where you were born. It's your life. Um, at the moment, and again, this podcast is not about uh, politics or about arguments or whatever the case may be. It's just a. Uh, I always some may disagree. I always end our podcast. We don't tolerate, you know, people that comment and and, and pass bad comments. It's it's not what this show is all about. But it's there's two parties in, on the island at the moment in racing and. The question I'm asking is, will it be okay, or what's going on there at the moment? I, I, I really can't answer your question, what the future holds. All I can tell you is the facts as they are. Uh, in January this year, the government passed legislation, and they took over everything what has to do with the organization of racing. So this is now a function of government. It used to be a function of the Mauritius Turf Club. It's now a function of government. Uh, that. Obviously, the Mauritius Turf Club uh, fought, fought against it. Uh, and in the meantime, we're not granted a license to operate. So the Gambling Regulatory Authority issued another horse racing license to w w what is known as the People's Turf Club. Uh, so at the moment, you've got two race course operators operating in Mauritius. Each have been given by the 
horse racing division of the Gambling Regulatory Authority a certain number of race meetings to run. So you've got two organizations, each running 20 race meetings a year on the island on the same course. Uh, it, it's bringing a lot of difficulty, especially on the operational level, because nobody is really responsible about the track. And that track is old, and that track is a difficult track. It's a hard track. Uh, it's hard on the horses. And if you don't look after it properly, uh, uh, you know, it tends to deteriorate, and it has deteriorated quite badly this yeah. year. So that's a result of not having certainty on, on to look after the track. So what the future holds is completely unknown. You know, uh, the one thing I would be extremely sad to see is that racing stops in Mauritius because it's, mm, yeah. to me, it's, it's, as I say, it's part of the culture of Mauritius. It's, it's, it's an institution. Yeah. And uh, it would be ruining the, it, if it had to stop, I mean, the, 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 the people of the country would be distraught, devastated. Yeah, it would have a terrible social uh, impact on, on the citizens of Mauritius. So I'm just hoping that uh, somewhere along the line, you know, sense will prevail and the government will see uh, that uh, what has what has been achieved through that restructure has actually been detrimental to the sport. Did, did it come as a surprise to uh, the people of Mauritius and those involved in Mauritius racing that racing has gone two ways and it's gone on a di downward spiral? Yeah, I, I think it's obvious. I mean, you know, the uh, when you look at the total turnovers, for example, this year they dropped by 30%. Sure, uh, it's a big drop in one year. Uh, and the attendances seem to have dropped. The, uh, the ownership base has shrunk. People are less inclined to buy horses. Do, do the public have uh, favoritism for which race meetings they, um, they go to? Uh, Rail, I, 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 I'm only watching on TV, yeah. so it's hard to judge. Um, but at this stage, I think there's more attendances on the Mauritius Turf Club races than there is on the People's Turf Club. Um, but that's just my visual, yes, yes. Yeah, from my what visual you're comment. On TV, you know, yeah, yeah, what yeah, I sure. see on TV, it might not be reality. Mm. I, I'm not. Uh, I don't have details of attendances. Let's talk about your horses. You know, one or two horses that you've owned in, in the past that have been good horses, because you've been blessed and lucky to have some good ones along the way. You spoke about all your lasts. But uh, there were also lots of winners, and I say this with respect. Before Rahil's time, I said me remember was them. Born, you mean. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's great because uh, I laughed at somebody the other day. You know, at the races, they said to me, uh, you know, and everyone's entitled to their opinion. He said, you know, what's this young chap doing at the races? You know, he's presenting. I said, well, sir, you know, you, you've got to have the future. You've got to bring people in. That are young, you know, you all started somewhere. He must start and work his way up. And, and, and how else is he going to learn? He said, Oh, now that you mentioned that, he said, Because, you know, I'm an old man and I've been racing for a long time. And, and I said, But yeah, we need new young blood in. And, and we do. We do, we do. So, yeah, before he was born, you're quite right. Uh, tell us about some of your good horses and your current string at the moment. And have you had any graded winners? Yeah. Yeah, I had a great advice. Look, as a bloodstock agent, I was involved with some very, very top, top horses, you know, so mostly for Robert Mangard and, and his partners. Uh, you know, hopefully like respectable, uh, who fought out with Roland Song, one of the epic duels of the turf. It's uh, just as good as as the one we had at Clearwood with Modelman. The, so I've been involved with some very top horses, respectable Ram third in the July, she won the Oaks, she won, you know, the Clearwood Gold Vars twice, should have won it three times. And uh, in the brown colours, then? Yeah, she ran in all Cilius colours, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, bought her for a song at the Ready to Run sale. In fact, you know, we, Ricky and I bought the top uh, lot of the Ready to Run sales for five years when Chris Smith started it in 1984. Sure. Uh, my best horse would probably have been Young Harvest. Also oh, bought at the ready to run. Black and white silks. Yeah, black and white silks. The Ben Island called silks. Who was that trained by? Uh, Ricky. Ricky. Uh, by Hard Up. Uh, you know, Ricky and I looked at all the horses that ready to run in different areas, and then we would sit in my cubicle at the at the sales ground and compare notes. And uh, so he's, the question was, who who are your five stars? And and this horse was both five five stars. Yeah. And so we went to see him. A son of hard up and there he was 
Charlie Chaplin. The legs were like this. <laughs> and Ricky said to me, we can't sell that to a client. <laughs> I said, no, but we, we must buy him. He said, of course we must buy him. Would you see his work this morning? But we can't sell that to a client. He was like this. So phone three mates. <laughs> and, and each took 20%, the five of us, Ricky, myself, and Ben, and I call it Silks at Bren, the and uh, Russian guys, and raced him. Well, he won the computer form stream in Joburg, he won the Gil which was the Gilbies, yeah, which is the today the Gilby Stakes, yeah, which is Scott's today ball. the Golden Horseshoe. The, the, the hmm. yeah, so he did well. I was there, yeah, I was there, yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. He was a good horse. Yeah, he was good. And your colors, your colors are uh, yellow and black. Yeah, they, right? they, they, well, now, yeah. My, my first colors were green and black. I hated them. <laughs> Why did you hate them? But in those days, you didn't have a choice. You know, you were told that's what you could. Oh, okay. I hated them. They were like... Superstitious because of green? No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no. Just, I didn't, you couldn't see them from afar, you okay. know. The, and... Uh, and I mentioned that one day, Mrs. Oppenheimer was, was at the races, and uh, I'm, I must have mentioned it at the table. She was there watching her horses. Ricky trained s some of their horses. And then I got, a, I got a call from Ricky a month later. Mrs. Oppenheimer phoned and said, tell your young Russian man to go to the jockey club now. I'm giving up uh, Sir Philip Oppenheimer's collars. Okay. And uh, all yellow with a black cap. So these were my silks. Mm. Now, the, so I went and I rushed and I was very grateful and she very kindly even sent me a set of, uh, I think it was natural silk that she had okay, made. Sure. And so I, I was, and I loved my colors, my black and uh, black, yellow and black. Now, unbeknown to me, very close friend of mine in Mauritius, his family colors were the same. Yet all yellow, black um, cap, um, Francois, Francois Dumais. Dumais yes, his sir. father, Rico Dumais. And Rico, I, when I finished school, I did one year's articles with his firm, uh, who was associated to Cooper's Library before coming here to, to do my articles with Cooper's. And um, so Francois said to me, I've inherited the family silks, you know, so, and we all, so he, whenever he bought a horse, I had to take a share in because it had to run in his <laughs> colors, which were my colors. You know. <laughs> okay. And then in 2009, when I was asked to leave, uh, you know, the I thought, well, we'll probably go back to Mauritius. I had a young family. It was, it made sense. Uh, there were opportunities in Mauritius, so I, I swapped colours with him. So the colours I've got today, which is black with, with the cross, uh, with the yellow cross slashes and the yellow sleeves, uh, these were Francois's colours, and and he's now got mine. Okay, Jeez, that's uh, an interesting story. I yeah. didn't know that. That's a great story. About so you've never got to choose your colours. The first one's never, <laughs> and the second one I love them so much. I, but but yeah, I, I, my friend John de Grandpre had an all yellow silk with a fleur de lis, a black fleur de lis, a fleur de lis, which I loved. And I must have said that at the table because then we got the call a couple, cool. of, yeah, maybe a few weeks later. Sure. Ricky phoned me. This is up, and I phoned told you please go to the Jacques Le tomorrow morning. She'll be in Johannesburg handing back those colours, yes. and she'll tell them that they're for you. That's amazing. That's yeah. a lovely story. Michelle, let's talk about your... Well, where do you live? I mean, obviously, well, you've got a home in Mauritius, and you, you, we've got a home... Where, where you, I, I don't have a home in Mauritius. My wife has a home in Mauritius. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about... Uh, where, in, Durban, in Durban, where are you? In, in, in Amstlange? I'm in La Lucia. Okay. We bought up a duplex, lock, lock up and go again, anticipation that we were going back in okay. 2009, uh, and that's where I live. And tell us about your family. You're, you're, you're married to... Um, um, married to Marilo. She's uh, Mauritian uh, like me. Uh, we actually met uh, when I went to for a week's work with Ricky. Ricky was going through a divorce with Jacqueline and we went together and that's where I met Marilo. Was he your wingman? Uh, was no. he your wingman? No, 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 no. The story is, is not to be broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Ricky, we went, went together for a week and met Marilo there and I went back again for another, because I used to go there selling horses there, you know, I was a bloodstock agent then, I used to go three, four times, five times a year, uh, always staying at the same hotel, met her again, uh, and that's where it started. So we got three sons, uh, my eldest is now 34, yeah. Okay. he's married, uh, lives in Mauritius, Okay. with a child. Uh, my second son, Eric, is in Cape Town, also married. 
uh, and my youngest son, he's now in Mauritius, he's been in Mauritius for a couple of years now, uh, he works on yachts, he loves his yachts, and at the moment he works for a one owner. Okay. So he takes the boats out and take the tourists out, you know. Sure. Okay, fantastic. Are two other kids, they involved in all things? Uh, they, they, they follow the game, they love it. I always send them a copy of the computer form before the July. They, they like to take their bets and uh, they, I'm pretty sure all of them will own racehorses when, when they can afford it, yeah. as they get a bit older. Um, but they've been part of racing. My youngest, uh, the, the boys, cost me a lot of money. The boys used to come with racing with me when they were kids, and every, they each, uh, we had 10 ren to, for the, each of them to yeah. bet, you know. Hmm. And I was always pinking the shore the sure place bet so that they would come home with 16 or 18 or <laughs> 24, <laughs> whatever so it is. Profit, yeah. <laughs> the one time, uh, Ricky had two runners at the race. Uh, he had a sprinter that belonged to Robert Megard. We were all sharing a swing. He was 9 to 10 on. Not sure if it's Jeff that was riding him. And then we had a first timer, a stayer, called the Decimator. They belonged to Norman San and, and you know, where, where I had a share in, you know. And he was uh, 99 to 1 on the third because there was no. Sure. So you have a nine to ten and yeah. nine to nine to one. Yeah. So, Jean Michel, my eldest, said to me, uh, I want my ten ren on yours. I said, No, you can't win. You must take on Uncle Robert's horse because he will win. You know? yeah. No, I want my ten ren on yours. But he insisted. So, I, in the end, I said, Okay, you've, you've got, because, and I didn't put it on. <laughs> Paid 114 ren a win. So, I had to forecast. <laughs> Over a thousand ren. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lesson I think everybody in race. Uh, it's happened to me once. And that was the. So you had to. So you paid up. You I had to up, pay 1,140. I was livid. I went to the 9 to 10 run. You ran Oh, goodness gracious me. I had a, a show of a friend uh, who's unfortunately had a stroke now and he's unwell in the Cape. He phoned me up uh, when Sushi San ran second in the July. Uh, Ian Falcon's Ian Falcon's horse was, I think, Sushi San. Anyway, could please take this exactor for me in the July. I said, oh, I said, the queues are, are long and the, it's going to load now. He said, please, just do it for me. And, you know, anyway, uh, I said, yeah, you've got a bet. Look, I said, Sushi San can't run a place in the July. Of course, I said, you've got the 10 exactors. Um, and of course, Sushi San ran up the outside rail here and ran a great second in the July. And I phoned up, he phoned me up. I'm so happy. What great did it, pay? it paid. It paid. Rahil, it was so many years ago, I can't, but it was thousands. I had to pay him a good couple of thousands, but be that as it may. So if somebody asks you to take a bet, you take it. <laughs> Michelle, um, hobbies, you know, in, in, as we nearing the home straight of this interview, uh, in your busy schedule, what, what besides racing and, and cooking and enjoying a good cuisine, what uh, else do you do that keeps you happy? I'm a once a week golfer. Okay. But uh, the, my life is taken up with racing. Okay. You know, the, okay. uh, not the I don't understand golf too much, but uh, what's your handicap on? Golf. Golf, yes. <laughs> <laughs> golf. He knows handicap. It's golf. He's not a good golfer. Right on the 20, 20 handicap. 20. Yeah. But but she goes to show I know little. About well, that's all right. I mean, somebody asked me the other day about the cricket or something. I said, no, I think they'll score a few goals. <laughs> you, you make you make a habit of those things. I I have listened to you. Yes, that's a very good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, Another thing that they don't, that the public might not know about you is, and you'll probably disagree, but I've been at functions where I've heard you performing. You're a damn good singer. You love singing. Yeah, I used to sing a lot when I when I was a student. Well, student. I was doing articles, doing uh, uh, lectures at night at the University of Natal. Uh, I, I was part of a band, and we used to sing at functions. I used to be the singer and used to just to earn a little bit of money. We'd yeah. pay. I'm playing 21st birthdays or weddings and all sorts of things uh, and then specialized in a Mauritian Sega band okay. where we played at uh, saint Girard that uh, Robert Movis owned in BP Center for years every single every second Sunday I think we used to to have those functions so yeah I spent quite a lot of time and then probably ended my career singing braille shows that we did and that must have been in my God. Uh, Ages. Yeah, around the 80s, you know. Sure. Then I got married. 
<laughs> Michelle, besides Mauritius, your favourite holiday destination, where, where, where would you, do you enjoy going? I go to Mauritius. Go to Mauritius. You know, I'm, I'm not a keen traveller, you know, the, I'm becoming more and more a couch potato, if anything else, you know. <laughs> my wife moans about it all the time, she'd love to travel me. There's no excitement in traveling. Yeah, okay, interesting. And uh, talking about singing as well, going back to singing, uh, the man who you play golf with a lot, uh, our colleague Graham Hawkins, he's also a damn good singer. He also is a very good singer. I think he's very average. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wonderful sense of humor. You've got a great sense of humor and you've got to have a good sense of humor. Um, favorite part of the island, Mauritius? I mean, where's your favorite uh, or your favorite swimming spot on the island? Yeah, I mean, I'm Marshwazi. I mean, for me, that's yeah, the best I, swimming I, I grew up in the north, uh, the Perive Gombe area. So, all my school holidays as a kid, I used to go there and stay with some friends of mine. Um, so, the north is very special to me. We now my wife's house is in the west. Okay. It's also very enjoyable. I think the whole of Mauritius, uh, wherever you are, yeah, it's, everything it's, is so close. You know, the it's yeah. biased or not biased, uh, every hill yeah. people will. You know, it's. I must say, I haven't travelled a lot around the world. In fact, I haven't travelled around the world at all. I've been to Zimbabwe, Mauritius, Cape Town. That's it. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you came and said to me, here's an opportunity, let's go to England, or you want to go back again to Mauritius, I'd go back again. It's just, for, you can't believe, you've got to go and experience it, and you will, you're a youngster, and you will in time. It's, it's, you can't get your head around how beautiful it is until you're there, really, it's, it's, it's yeah, a smashing the, place. Probably the most beautiful spot of the island is, is the southwest corner. It's called Le Mans, it's, it's, it's a mountain. Uh, where the Paradis Hotel is, that beautiful golf course, this huge lump of stone, which is historically very famous, because when they were chasing slaves, they used to climb and throw themselves rather than be caught again. So <laughs> it's, it's actually a historical Shame. monument. It's a UNESCO site. Okay. Um, that is probably the most beautiful site on the island. That's that uh, part, uh, it, it, it sticks out, and it? it's, it's it, sort of at a bit of a Correct. shake like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, like a shoe, shoe uh, sitting at the bottom. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay. Then, uh, and, and it's surrounded by an incredible beach, and, and the waters are, are absolutely magnificent. It's, it's and then you've got this big lump of, of rock, That's of right, granite, right. which is and on the flats, as I said, there's a beautiful golf course here called the Parody. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's special. Your favorite golf course? Uh, here in South Africa? No, would that be your... No, no, as a golf course itself, it's not the best golf course. You know, the, it, the site is the best site. Uh, to me, it could be one of the world best uh, golf courses. Okay. Uh, from a from a positioning point of view, but it's not a it's not a golf resort. It's a resort with a golf course. Oh, you know, okay. the, it's it's so it's not specialized, looking after looking after it as if it's a five star golf course. You know, there's a horse running in Cape Town called Le Mans. Le Mans. Uh, yes. Mr. Yeah, yes. yeah. There's a lot of these horses named Mauritian names. I was just thinking the same thing. Is it named? After yes, that. yeah. The owner is Mukun Gajada. He loves his horse racing. He owns quite a few horses here, yes. uh, mostly with Brett Crawford. I yes, yes, yes. And uh, the, he's the son of Ramapati Gajada, who's the who, who's the the trainer for the Gajada family in Mauritius, mm -hmm. and loves horse racing. Probably owns a dozen horses. Yeah, here. yeah, that's right. Le Mans, it ran oh, the yeah. other day, and there's another one that they've, uh, they've got. They're naming a lot of these horses after Mauritian names, which is beautiful. He, he does, yeah. Yeah, and uh, do you remember the one that I think it's run three times, one three times, or it's maybe running this weekend, it's one twice. Anyway, Champion Warrior. That's exactly the, you see that. He's got some good horses here. Yeah, Champion yeah, Warrior going for three. You see, Michelle, uh, you and I, there's nothing wrong with our memory at our age, but these youngsters don't remember everything. What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, last thing before we wrap up. Uh, Hollywood uh, have, have phew, got behind uh, KZN Racing, Cape Racing, but Hollywood would be remiss if we didn't, you know, just talk about them for a moment and, and, and lovely that they're partners of ours and just for what they're doing for racing, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable, you know, the generosity of the Hollywood based group towards us. Uh, you know, COVID came and they bailed us out of, of, uh, of business rescue. That's where the company, without asking anything without asking anything in return and uh, our relationship has gone from strength to strength and uh, the amount of money that they actually put into horse racing is unbelievable i think uh, very you know and now they've they've gone into into helping the cape and looks to with Greg Boards and it looks like they've done a fantastic job in, in restoring the Cape and bringing back racing to its best and uh, 
No, it's it's fantastic, and and the same must be said about Mary Stack, what what she's done in, sure. in Johannesburg and PE with four racing. I mean, it's it's the generosity of those people that actually keeping the game alive. Yeah, absolutely. W we'd be in deep trouble when when you think about where horse racing was in the late 1990s before uh, the constitutional changes which m made gam gambling a provincial competence and gambling was open, horse racing had 100% of the gaming market and the racing clubs then had 60% of the gaming market. Now today, what's left of the racing clubs, we now called racing operators, have got less than 0.05% of the gaming market. And our, our betting system, which is the Parry Mutual, is in decline worldwide. It's lost its appeal, its popularity. Our customers are getting older. Uh, and we've had to diversify enormously just to survive. But even that would not have been en enough. And we, ne and we needed the help of friends. And uh, Hollywood bets have become a great friend of Gold Circle. Yeah, Long see. may it continue. Yeah, absolutely. They certainly have. Just before we wrap up, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge our sponsors, of course, a soccer, a score 10 and score 6, uh, the different soccer bets that you know, you need to get onto Tab Gold and get your bets on. You're a soccer, uh, how's it, you and uh, Frank Robinson, I had to pull them apart at the last podcast because you know what support, who do you support? Liverpool, he was a Man United. Uh, what's happened in the Liverpool and Man United teams? Anything, did they one lost anything since last week? United? Uh... United have lost actually. They lost to Aston Villa 3-1. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and Liverpool won. Okay. Yeah, Liverpool beat Spurs. Spurs 2-0. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so that is it 2-1? So Liverpool have the upper hand. Uh, okay. So, so when you bump into so Liverpool have the upper hand, your yeah. team. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, in, in terms of the league table, not uh, not they quite yet. Uh, but they they get in there slowly. You follow any football? I love British soccer. Yeah. You love it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which uh, which team do you follow? That's a stupid question. <laughs> 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 we're, we're waiting, we're waiting. You're waiting, you're waiting. You mean you're still, still waiting? waiting? I'm no, a Manu fan. I'm oh, a Manu fan. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no. Yes, yeah. In fact, we shall have to review your employment contract. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we started something here, the Exco team. We meet every Monday morning to report back on the activities of the week. And uh, we started bringing donuts. So, wh whichever team you followed lost, you had to bring donuts. Oh, so you have to bring donuts? And the, the last three years, the menu supporters, which is Raf Kendis, and I had to bring donuts every <laughs> week. Thank God this year Liverpool is contributing. <laughs> <laughs> I love the story. No, well, that's it. Okay, so that's uh, soccer score six and score ten. And of course, there's all the soccer bets that uh, we took. Thank you to them for, for their sponsorship, a Tam Gold product. And uh, Andrew Harrison, our good friend, he's still in the Kalahari's. And the Kalahari's, since he's semi retired, he's spending more time away than he does here. Yeah, you see, that's that's the, we we're very good pairs at Gold Circle. <laughs> so he's gone to the Kalahari. Our good friend, he'll be back uh, next week, I think, or the week after. But it's been great having Raheel uh, join us as well, and and we hope that he'll continue being part of our podcast team. Let's hope he hasn't taken those cheap trips, fishing trips, because sending somebody to the Kalahari for fishing, he's a fishing guy. Uh, yeah, fishing and bush, I believe. He likes the bush, and he, he says that anywhere you can go, we can see these people. He could have been fallen to that trap and gone fishing in the Kalahari. <laughs> I mean, that would be the cheap trip that he would have saw the cheap price and, 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 and gone fishing in the yeah. Kalahari. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we wish Andrew well on his holiday. And just before we wrap, it's your birthday tomorrow. Um, so congratulations to you. We wish you all the very best. Many happy years. And uh, yeah, and uh, we will wish you again tomorrow. Make sure you bring birthday cake, please. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank it's you. It's going to be a Liverpool cake, though, so. <laughs> well, I don't mind. I'm not a soccer fan, but you, you won't have any Liverpool cake. You've got supporters in the office. You've got Steve, you've got Patrick, who are staunch Liverpool supporters. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they'll yeah. have some of your birthday cake. But happy birthday to you, Rahil, for tomorrow. But that's a wrap. Michelle, thank you for, for your time. I know you're busy. You can see what your desk looks like. you got piles of paperwork to get through. But it's been lovely just to chat and to hear a bit uh, of your story. And thanks for, for, for all your support of the industry and the support of all of us. As staff, not only are you our CEO, but you're our fearless leader and uh, colleague and very good friend. So thank you for your time. Pleasure, guys. Lovely. That's a wrap from us. We'll see you next week. We're obviously, as you can see, we're at Hollywood Bench Gravel at headquarters. We're not at Summerfeld. Open for breakfast. Go and enjoy yourself up there. It really is a wonderful spot. It's open to the public, uh, reasonably priced, and, and just a wonderful venue to go and take the family for breakfast. From Rahil Krishna, Michelle Narak, Warren Linferner, and the entire team, Tawanda and the whole team from behind the scenes, we thank you and we wish you all the very best.
Thank you for watching this week's episode of In the Box Seat Podcast right until the very end. We hope that you enjoyed it because we certainly did. If you missed last week's podcast, In the Box Seat Podcast with Andrew and myself, please go and watch it here. And uh, last week's uh, episode will be right there for you to go and enjoy and watch as uh, we know you will certainly enjoy In the Box Seat Podcast from last week.